Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's uh, April 8th, 2020. I'm Jim Hodson, the Executive Director here at the Fort Worth Aviation Museum. And this is our Wednesday, Wednesday edition of Fun with Aviation. And today we're gonna feature the RF-8 Crusader. So this is our RF-8 Crusader. Uh, this is a very special airplane to me in a lot of ways. Uh, one is that this was an airplane that when I was uh, when I was in the Marine Corps and flying, this was an airplane that I'd always wished that I could have flown. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in the Chicago area, the first jets that I saw were F-86s. And I guess that's where I got my, uh, my interest in, in aviation and wanting to, uh, wanting to fly. Uh, the F-8, uh, when I finally got to the point where I was in the Marine Corps and wanting to fly, the F-8s were almost out of service and it was an airplane that I'd always wanted to fly. There was a certain swagger about the F-8 drivers uh, and the, especially the gun squadron guys. And uh, so I always wanted to, uh, to be one of the last of the gunfighters. Didn't have that opportunity. Uh, I did fly RF-4s and so we're gonna talk a little bit about the differences and some of the things that we did in between. One of the things I'm gonna show you ahead of time here is this is our RF-8A Crusader. We call it Katrina and I'll tell you why in a little bit. But, uh, bureau number 146898. This airplane is special. You'll see it had a unit citation, uh, an excellence ribbon, national defense ribbon, and a Vietnam service ribbon. We don't know the full history on this airplane, but the RF-8s in general are very special. There were only about 1,200 F-8s that were built in, uh, out of Grand Prairie, and only 144 or so of them were RF-8s. This airplane's job is a photo reconnaissance aircraft and its job was to take take pictures. Uh, it didn't have any guns. The guns were taken off of the airplane and uh, in, re in replace of the guns uh, they put uh, fuel cells so that the airplane could uh, could fly longer. So we're going to show you a little bit about this. You'll see a patch on the nose. This is where Katrina comes in. Uh, this airplane after it, uh, it was retired from service uh, was on display at the uh, at, in Mobile, Alabama at the, uh, the, the exhibit there with the battleship. During uh, Katrina, uh, the, uh, the sea surge broke down some of the roof and walls of the museum, uh, the display area, and airplanes got sloshed around. This one got damaged pretty badly. And so uh, it was uh, taken to Pensacola where it was, they were getting ready to send it to the range at Eglin. They were gonna bomb it uh, on the, on the uh, bombing range there. Uh, just so happened we had a crew that was in Pensacola to pick up our uh, A4 Charlie and uh, uh, this was sitting over in the corner and uh, they asked what was going to happen and they told them it was going to be uh, it was going to be sent out to the uh, to the weapons range and so the guys called me up and they said can we bring this home and so we talked about it a lot and decided to do that one of the things with airplanes that we get here is we don't often know the story of the airplane before we get it uh, sometimes it's only afterwards that we uh, we truly learn the full story on the airplane. So here's the background on this one. This is what makes this one truly special. Uh, not only was it uh, was it built here, but it flew here with the VMJ-4. That's a Marine Photo Reconnaissance Squadron, or was. Remember we talked about it before. V means it was fixed wing. M means it was Marine Corps. And for a while, uh, the J stood for utility or for photo reconnaissance. So VMJ-4 meant that it was uh, the fourth squadron uh, and that was a reserve squadron. It was always, it was uh, based in Olathe, Kansas. It was based in New Orleans, but it finished up its career here in Dallas uh, as far as the Marine Reserves were concerned. Uh, at the point in time that it was here in Dallas, the commanding officer of VMJ-4 was none other than Neil Anderson. Uh, famous test pilot for, for Lockheed and General Dynamics with the F-16 and other aircraft. And we have pictures of him with his squadron uh, at uh, NAS Miramar when they were out there for deployment. So what we're going to show you is underneath the nose, and we don't have the, we don't have the, uh, the housing for it, but this was station number one, and it had cameras in it that looked forward. Then we go back here a little bit further, you'll see another window and you'll see a camera mount inside. This is station number two. And this is station number three and four. There's also, you can see inside there just a little bit, cameras would be in here. And in this particular one, you can see where there was a slot where it could look down below. So the cameras were for many different purposes. Uh, when it was daytime, they had sensors in the bay there that would show, uh, show the, add light 
uh, for the uh, to be able to adjust the cameras uh, the, the cameras aperture and settings uh, let's see so we've got one of the things is that this airplane had day and night missions and that was not the case with the fighter version the fighter version was a day fighter in fact it was the first uh, naval aircraft to be able to break the speed of sound these these aircraft were capable of 1.86 speed of sound or about 1200 miles an hour you'll see a big yellow dot here and behind that you'll see a panel it's pretty nondescript doesn't show much but there's one of those on both sides of the airplane and those panels would open up and there were flares there for night photography so what would happen is the flares would pop out and then there was a sensor in the camera bay that would see the the light of the flare go off and it would trip the shutter and take the picture so we had daytime and nighttime with uh, stations three and four back here they also had the capability of doing panoramic or horizon to horizon photographs so what else makes these airplanes special well there's two things in particular one is that they were they were involved in the start of a war and the other one was uh, they probably stopped a war these were the first airplanes, uh, Navy squadrons, VFP 62 and 63, that were the first airplanes to do uh, combat missions over, over Vietnam. Uh, they flew photo reconnaissance missions over, uh, over Laos. The other one that they're probably more famous for is the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. U-2s had found uh, that, the, that the Russians were starting to bring uh, missiles into uh, into Cuba and stationing surface-to-air missiles uh, and also ground-to-ground uh, -ground missiles. So they uh, they got high-altitude pictures with the U-2s, but they needed something that was a little bit more uh, a little bit more detailed. So the Navy's uh, VFP 62 and 63 squadrons out of Key West and Jacksonville uh, were, were given the task of going into Cuba and taking pictures. They went in in two plane formations. One of the reasons for that was mutual protection. The other one was, at that point in time, we're taking film. Uh, this was not data linked anywhere. It was hard film. So if we lost an airplane, you lost the film. So there, we had an old saying in the Marine Corps, if you've got one, you've got none. If you've got two, you've got one. So they were sent in in pairs for mutual support and also to uh, hope that they would get at least some pictures back. Now, over the course of uh, 13 days, squadrons were flying these missions day and night for 13 days, uh, they were augmented by some of the uh, Marine pilots and also the Marines uh, VMC J2, I believe it was. But they took 160,000 pictures of the missiles in Cuba. A couple of other things I want to show you here before I show you something very special. So you'll see right up here this notch, right up here. So with the this airplane was very sensitive in terms of uh, its ability to fly at low air speeds. So what they did is they they had a, a wing break so that the entire wing would lift up for landings. So we've talked before about angle of attack and the angle of the, the fuselage to the relative wind. Well with this airplane uh, being as long as it is and because of its speeds this was a high-speed airplane, so it was had trouble getting slow. So the way they fixed that is the whole wing would raise up, the cockpit would uh, and fuselage would stay where they were at, but the wing would raise up. So the view from the cockpit was the same. But this airplane also didn't have the ability to really rotate off of the ground so much. So if you've ever seen B-52s or F-8s take off, they kind of lift up off of the ground. They don't really rotate and go. So, but around the boat, when they had to get slow, the wing would get cocked up and then you had leading edge flaps and slats in addition to the, uh, the trailing edge that would lower down so that the airplane had some controllability around the boat. Now anybody who knows much about landing on air aircraft carriers, there is a certain angle that you come in at, normally about four and a half degrees, which was very difficult for the F-8 to maintain. It had to maintain within three quarters of one degree to be able to bring it aboard the boat. So. Uh, some of the bravado of the F-8 drivers was well-deserved. This was a, an airplane that required a lot of skill to fly and to fly properly. So this is just kind of a quick walk around. You'll notice that uh, this, is not, this airplane is not in the best shape. Uh, it's been for a long, slow uh, restoration work, uh, mainly because, as I've mentioned before, our airplanes are kind of supported by 
uh, by individual people who have an affinity for the airplane. So we haven't had a lot of support for this one. So it's been a long, slow preparation, and we hope at some point that we will be able to uh, complete the restoration on this airplane and put it back into its colors. We don't know what that's going to be. The last airplane, uh, the last squadron it was in was VFP-63, as you can see here. And it was also aboard the Midway. And there's the bureau number. We've talked about bureau numbers. This one is 146898. A couple of the other special things about this airplane. This particular airplane was the highest time airplane in the U.S. Navy ever. Highest time F-8 ever in the Navy. Again, one of the things that we don't know when we when we first get the airplanes. There's another uh, pedostatic tube. It looks very much like some of the others. Airplane was built in 55 and they were flown up through about 1987. The last squadron to fly them here in the United States was the uh, was uh, uh, the Navy, although the Marines flew them for a while as photo reconnaissance. Uh, the French Navy were the last ones to operate the airplane uh, and uh, the Philippine Air Force uh, flew them for a little while. Well, we've got a few minutes. I'm going to walk over and show you something very special as part of our collection. There's our F5. We're going to have to do the story on that one because uh, our F5 here is our movie star. This airplane was one of the black MiGs in the movie Top Gun. So you can always come by and get its signature. It's always glad to do that. Now, this trailer looks pretty nondescript, but what you're going to find inside is that early simulators were not based in one place and you went to them. They only had a few and they would move them around. So this particular trailer is an RFA trailer. They did the same thing with B-52s and other airplanes, although with B-52s, their simulators were in railroad cars. <coughs> so we're going to have something here. We're going to walk in and you're going to go right back into the 1950s. So this is the simulator bay, the cockpit. So we'll be able to show you the cockpit here in just a second. And this is where the instructor operated the simulator. We'll take a more detailed look at that. Here in the back, the part that really fascinates me is this is the working end of it. So you can take a look in this entire simulator and it had motion, it was controlled by tubes. Racks and racks and racks and racks of tubes. Now this was the technicians or the maintenance uh, persons, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the maintenance persons area. And you can see all kinds of electrical, all kinds of electrical components, fuses, diodes, capacitors, and tubes. And this is just the way we got this. Oops, sorry, bumped the camera there. We were very fortunate in, uh, in acquiring this, and when we did, there were things about it that we didn't know, like most of the things that we have here. So this is the control panel for the instructor. You can see that they can do all kinds of procedures, turn things on and off, make life difficult for the pilot inside. He can see all of the gauges that the pilot has. He can control systems, turn them on, turn them off. He can see exactly what the pilot's doing. And in fact, the other thing is there's a moving map here. So he can see if the pilot is going in the places that he's supposed to be going. Now one of the other things that we didn't know about this, uh, this simulator when we first got it was where it had been and who had, who had utilized it. So when we got it, we found a drawer full of training jackets. And the names on these training jackets are the same people who were flying our airplane outside. So this simulator, along with our airplane outside, go together. Now I'm getting a message that's saying I've got low network connectivity so we're going to continue here best we can. We're going to show you a little bit of the cockpit. Cockpit on an RF-8 is very much different than on a, on a gun airplane. You'll notice uh, what looks like a uh, a big round uh, radar scope right up there at the top of the uh, control panel. That's actually a periscope. So all of the gun stuff and all the armament were taken out of these airplanes and what you did, the only thing you could do was uh, tell people to smile and take their picture. But you used that periscope to be able to guide you on the ground into the area where you knew you were going to be taking pictures. You didn't always know what your target was. When I flew the RF-4, uh, we would be told an area that we needed to go to, 
and uh, we would go into that that area <coughs> excuse me and turn on all of the sensors and be able to get the get the pictures we needed and brought them back and then the photo intel people uh, worked on it from there but that was the periscope that you could look in through there on the stick you'll notice that there's a trigger on the stick it's not for guns remember no guns but what it was for was to be able to insert a particular uh, frame in the picture roll that you were taking you might see as you were going along you might see something that was interesting that was coming up in the periscope and you'd go ahead and click that now as I mentioned it had the ability to take night photograph under flares but this was all pretty much uh, common photography work uh, it was normal film daytime nighttime so here's another picture on the wall that we've got here to show a little bit about uh, the stations that I talked about outside. Station 1 looking down and forward, Station 2 straight down. Stations 3 and 4 can look down and they can also look out to the sides. And we've got some other, some other diagrams here for people to come in through here. Uh, we are very fortunate that uh, you can see some steps outside. We've just completed those, or I want to say more pro appropriately, uh, an Eagle Scout project uh, completed those for us. <clears throat> so that what we're going to be able to do when we have the, uh, the simulator open is people are going to be able to walk right through. So let's see. So uh, I'm going to mention that uh, uh, this... Uh, this particular simulator and what we're doing in here, uh, a lot of the work in here and getting the lights to work again uh, are contributable to uh, Bucky Gear. And in fact, uh, Bucky is, uh, is going to is sponsored uh, us repainting the exterior of this. I want you to notice that uh, in here, when, when the doors are all closed and you close the sliding door, it gets real quiet. Well, this was all simulation, so the instructor would normally be out at that console, but they could simulate daytime, nighttime. And we even have some red lights in here, if I can find them again. In the event that you had emergencies and fire, the red light would come on. Now, the instructor could also sit on this seat and sit next to you for things like cockpit familiarization and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but they all didn't always do that. Mostly, they, uh, they did that from back in the console. But I can show you that uh, one of the other uh, significant historical uh, features of this simulator are that we have historical cigarette butts. Uh, still here in the ashtray. This was back in a time when it wasn't a big deal to be smoking around computer equipment and that kind of thing. So now you know what the cockpit of the F-8 looks like. Uh, this was an airplane that you wore. You can tell it's a very tight fit in the cockpit. Controls on the other side for, for radios and the controls underneath here, if I can get a good picture of them. These were the controls for the cameras. And there are more control camera controls up front. The rest of it is uh, our con our instrumentation for your your flight instrumentation. And here's a close up of the of the periscope. So again, this is uh, this is very special for us, and we found that we have a lot of airplanes here that. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, I got got a question from uh, from uh, Mike. Uh, Lepec and says when can we come and fly it uh, as we usually have this uh, this open for hops and props so whenever uh, our current emergencies are open and we can do this so uh, we will go ahead and uh, have this open during hops and props day so people can come out sit in the cockpit uh, and see this uh, this simulator we did have a group come out here uh, uh, quite a while ago and did some filming in here and, and use this as a uh, uh, as a, a setting for a uh, uh, an outer space uh, spaceship but when you walk in here all of your senses are assaulted uh, you walk in and you can smell the 1950s in here so, so we walk back out take another quick look at the at the RF8 and that'll be our, our session for today I appreciate that we've had a number of people that have come out and, and taken a look at this and this, uh, this airplane the RF8 is is a special airplane to me in general and it's a special airplane in and of its its own right. Uh, the other thing is that the, this airplane, in addition, I mentioned that it was a high time uh, ever Navy F-8. It had uh, close to 8,000 flight hours on it, and it had over uh, over 600 uh, carrier landings by the end of its career. So, 
hope you've enjoyed this we will do uh, we will do another walk around on saturday in the meantime uh, hope you all stay safe keep your distance stay well uh, again we've got resources on our website if you want to see more videos not just these walk arounds but a lot of other videos and uh, we have coloring pages for the young folks uh, we have uh, paper airplanes for anybody and if you've enjoyed this walk around and you'd like we got a little donation button up above throw us a buck or two it would help us because we have no income at this point like a lot of people so at any rate from the Fort Worth Aviation Museum home of the most touchable airplanes in Texas I'd like to thank you for joining us and y'all have a good week and I'll see you on Saturday <music>